This is a lesson on induction, which is related to changing magnetic flux in a unit on magnetism. We're going to start this lesson right with the force on a moving charge. That's the easiest way to think about what's going on with inducing an electromagnetic force. And what I have here is the definition of an induced electromagnetic force is a voltage arising due to magnetic forces on moving charges. And what I have here is a picture from the Hewitt Conceptual Physics 10th edition book where we are just rotating a wire loop in a magnetic field. So these dotted gray lines in the background are the magnetic field. And the loop has no current in it. All it is is a conducting loop, and we're just going to rotate it in that magnetic field. And so when I think about that charge, all along here are charges, right? There's a Q here, a Q here. There's an infinite amount of charges, basically, all along this loop in this magnetic field. And if I rotate it, the charges will have a velocity in the magnetic field. And you can see, based on this equation up here, when I have a charge moving with a velocity in a magnetic field, it could feel a force. In this first situation here, I'll call it A, we can see that the velocity vector is lined up with a magnetic field vector, and so these charges up here feel a force of zero. And that would be the same for the charges down here. They're moving in this direction in the magnetic field, and they'd feel zero force as well. However, if we look at the next situation, which I'll call B, Let's look at the charges here. I have um, the same three charges here, and now I'm going to note that because this loop is rotating in a magnetic field, the charges are now moving perpendicularly to the magnetic field. Well, I can do a cross product on that and um, do right hand rule. I have velocity vector down, that's my thumb, and then the B vector is to the right, and I get the charges are feeling a force out of the page. All right, so there's a force all along those charges out of the page. And so that's what I said here, a voltage difference arising due to magnetic forces on moving charges. So these charges are not moving because there's a current. These charges are moving because of the rotating loop. Okay, and that's the velocity vector here. Because this loop is causing the charges to move in the magnetic field, they're going to feel a force. When I get a bunch of charges in a row feeling that force, what that's going to do is cause a current, right? If all those charges are feeling a force and they're in a conductor and they're free to move, they're going to move and that will cause a current in that direction. And so we can see in this uh, loop here, the current would move in, if you looked at it from the top, a clockwise direction like that. That would be an I. So we can get a current to flow. And what we know is that conventional current flows from high to low potential. All right, That's from circuit stuff. Current always flows from high to low potential. So when I look at this, I see that the current is moving out of the page at me on the right side here. So I know this has to be a high potential here and this has to be a low potential over on this side. So if you see any questions where they ask what's the high or low potential end of something, you'll be able to figure that out. And what we're seeing is I can keep rotating this and notice when the orientation is here, the voltage, what I have down here is a graph of the voltage, right? The graph of the voltage is maximum and in this orientation and it's zero in this orientation. You can see when the loop goes uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field, it goes to zero again and then we have a maximum. Uh, and so we get this oscillating back and forth. And naturally what we're going to produce with this motion is an alternating current. Uh, it will change directions. Okay, so uh, that is the basics of an induced electromagnetic force. And we won't use this equation in order to calculate these anything in here. What we're doing is we're intuitively starting with forces on magnetic charges and we can see that a force is created and I can have a high and low potential created from just moving a charge in a magnetic field and inducing a current. There wasn't a current initially, but we can induce a current just based on rotating that loop in a magnetic field. Very fascinating effect, right?
And so people had been discovering this. It turns out that if you keep the loop still and move the magnetic field, you can also see this effect. An easy way to see this in a lab would be to construct a solenoid. It may be just as easy as a slinky and run a magnet through the coils. We can hook it up to an ammeter or galvometer or voltmeter, etc. And what you see is a voltage is produced with an associated current. And we know Ohm's law can relate those two, right? If I have a voltage, then I can relate it to the current if I know the resistance. And that's what we're going to call an induced EMF. An EMF is measured in volts, and I'll get to this a little bit more in the next few slides. But what I wanted to show you here is just keeping that loop still and moving the magnet through will create, and notice on the ammeter, the galvometer here, I can get a positive reading and I can get a negative reading, right? And that corresponds, and I can get a zero reading. That corresponds to, on the prior slide, I'm going to have some sort of directionality. So that directionality is going to be a key principle as we move forward as well. All this ties down to Faraday's law. The induced voltage in a coil varies directly to the number of loops, so it depends on how many loops are here, and the rate at which the magnetic flux changes, right? That's where I started this whole lecture, is that we're looking at changing magnetic flux. If we go back to the prior slide here and we look at this rotating coil, we can think about the amounts of flux through the area of this loop changing as that loop rotates. And so that's what the fundamental principle is here is that we're going to be looking at changing magnetic flux. Okay, you can look at this in simulations in a lab and then also one of the easiest things I found is to find a copper pipe and drop a magnet through it and it actually falls slower. So let's do a quick review of magnetic flux. Magnetic flux is the amount of magnetic field passing through a surface area. And remember this comes from an integral with a dot product. We have to think about how parallel and how perpendicular the area vector is and the magnetic field. And that's what this phi, uh, this is the angle phi, that's what that angle refers to is the angle between the area or the normal vector to the area and the magnetic field. So in this situation, here we can see that the area vector, the normal vector, is aligned with the magnetic field and we have maximum magnetic flux. And we don't care if there's magnetic flux, we care if there's changing magnetic flux. So get that into your head and I'll emphasize it as we move forward in the lesson that we're looking at how the magnetic flux changes. So in this situation, it, to begin with A, there's maximum magnetic flux. And then when it rotates to B, it changes to zero flux. In this situation, the area vector is pointing perpendicularly to the magnetic field and we can see there would be zero flux in this situation. Flux equals zero here, flux equals max here. And there was a change in magnetic flux from one situation to the other. And that continues through here. We can see that we're going to have a maximum EMF, a maximum induced voltage, when the loop is parallel and the area vector is perpendicular to that magnetic field. So when there's no flux in here, we're seeing that's when there's a maximum voltage or a maximum induced current. When there is a maximum flux, we see that the current and the voltage, the induced current and the induced voltage go to zero. So very interesting effect here. So instead of thinking about forces on charges, what Faraday said is we're going to focus on magnetic flux and how that magnetic flux changes as this loop is in the magnetic field, okay? so. Calculating with Faraday's law, this is the quantification of the relationship. A change in the magnetic flux passing through a loop will cause a voltage called the induced EMF. And so this is what we call the induced EMF. This is a cursive, a curly E. It's not an E like that. That's like electric field. So we don't use E for this. It's a curly E. And some people even put EMF here just to be clear that it is a voltage and not an electric field. 
There's a negative sign in here, which I'll talk about in a second, but you can see that there's a number of loops, n number of loops, and then this term here is the change in flux over the change in time. And notice that I could write that as flux final minus flux initial over t final minus t initial. This is generally just a time period, right? And this is a quantification of how the flux changes over time. I would figure out what's the initial flux, what's the final flux, and subtract those two, and it's very much like a line, right? If I were finding the slope of a line. I will note here that the negative sign indicates that the induced EMF or the induced current opposes the change in magnetic flux. And this is referred to as Lenz's law. Lenz's law really gives us this direction of the induced current. And what it said was the induced EMF opposes, the induced EMF induced current opposes the change in the magnetic flux. So we have to figure out the change in the magnetic flux and then the direction of the induced EMF and induced current will oppose that. And that's what's called Lenz's law. So what we're seeing is that the loops are sensitive to the amount of flux going through them. And Lenz's law ties in here that these loops will create an induced magnetic field to compensate for any loss or gain in flux. So again, I'm looking at any change in flux. Is there a loss of flux or is there a gain in flux? And I picked this example. I really like this example from OpenStax College Physics. And I popped it, I borrowed this picture from the text. And so what we're going to do is look at the loop as it moves through a magnetic field. I just have a loop and we'll assume that it has one loop. And we're going to let it move through the magnetic field. And so at each point here, we're going to look at the direction of the induced current. What's the direction of the induced current? Okay. So here's how I analyze the situations. Because we're looking at the change in the magnetic flux, I'm going to figure out what the initial is, I'm going to figure out what the final is, and then that will let me figure out what the change in the magnetic flux is. Once I find the change in the magnetic flux, the induced B field will oppose that. So I'm gonna put opposes here, these two oppose one another. And once I find the direction of the induced magnetic field, that means I can find the direction of the induced current with right hand rule two, curly right hand rule. And this is a process, I lay this out because this is a very systematic way to do problems. Once you learn how to do this, you can approach many different types of problems with this approach. And so we're focusing on initial flux, final flux, that change in flux. And then from there, we can use Lenz's law to figure out the induced magnetic field and then the right hand rule to figure out the direction of the induced current from there. So if I look at this situation, and remember I need an initial and final, so I need to pick two different situations. So I'm going to go from A to B, that'll be my first. Initial is A and my final is B, so I'll put that over here from A to B. And when I look at this initial situation, the loop is not in the magnetic field, so the initial flux is zero. I move the loop into the magnetic field, and in this situation, even though flux is a scalar, what I'm gonna think about here is that there's some flux, now there's some flux, and the magnetic field in this situation is out of the page. Remember, this is the symbol for an arrow coming at me, which means that it's out of the page. So in this final position, there's some final flux and the magnetic field is out of the page. So when I look at the change, I went from zero to some out, so the change has to be out of the page. There was an, a gain of magnetic field out of the page. Well, the induced magnetic field, the, the field induced by this loop is going to oppose this change. So whatever this is, the induced magnetic field will oppose it, so the induced magnetic field will be in. And I can use right hand rule then, my, I point my thumb into the page, I get my fingers curling in the clockwise fashion, and I get the current to be clockwise in this situation. So when I think about it, there's going to be a current in here in this direction, a counterclockwise current, I is counterclockwise. So when I think about it, there's going to be a current in here in this direction, a counterclockwise current, I is counterclockwise. 
which induces which causes a magnetic field into the page, okay? And notice that this magnetic field opposes the original magnetic field. This is the induced magnetic field, okay? So watch out. What I see students get confused here is that they think that the induced magnetic field is the same as the original external magnetic field, and they're not the same. There's an original external magnetic field, and then there's this induced one, which is found only in the loop. And so this loop ha originally had zero magnetic flux. It gained some out, and in order to try to get back to zero, it will create its own magnetic flux in the opposite direction, which is into the page, and corresponding to an induced current clockwise. All right, so that's how you figure that out. I wanted to do a couple more examples while we're on here. There's a couple of more situations going on. Um, I wanted to pick a situation maybe when the loop is in between B and C, when it's in the magnetic field, like in this region here, to a point over here between C and D. So we'll go from the point between B and C to the point between C and D. And what we're going to see is that the initial flux here is some out of the page, some, and the magnetic field is out. When we get over here, it's the same, right? Nothing's changed. The area of the loop hasn't changed. The orientation hasn't changed. When I calculate the magnetic flux here and the magnetic flux here, they are equal to one another. So in this situation, there's no change in flux. It's zero. Because there's no change in flux, there's no induced magnetic field, and because there's no induced magnetic field, there's no current. So even though you want to say it's in a magnetic field and there should be an induced current, what we need to know is that there's no changing flux. There is flux, but there's no changing flux, and that's what you need to watch for on these problems. Let's finish up this part. I want to go from position D to position E. So you can see in position D, there's some magnetic field going through the loop. So from D to E, uh, we're going to have some out. When it gets over to position E, we have zero flux through there. No longer is it in the magnetic field. It won't have any magnetic flux. And so the change is in, into the page. Right? We had some out. In order to get to zero, we had a change of in. And so the induced magnetic field will oppose that change in the flux. So it will be out, which means now I can do right-hand rule. Uh, my thumb is out of the page. My fingers curl counterclockwise. And so over in this final position, I will have a counterclockwise current going like this in this direction as it moves out of the magnetic field. So that's Lenz's law, and I find this often takes a lot of practice for students to get this consistently right, and the problems that they're shown can often trick them. Calculating induced EMF and induced currents is often not as difficult as finding the direction, right? So applying Lenz's law is a, usually it takes more reasoning than applying Faraday's law. So let's look at Faraday's law. Remember Faraday's law was the quantification of this. And I had just introduced this part of the equation, negative number of loops, change in flux over time. Well, what I did here was I put in what flux is, right? I have a change in flux, so that would be a change in this stuff. Remember, flux is A, B, cosine phi. So I say there's three ways that flux can change because there's three variables in here. I have the area variable, the magnetic field variable, and this angle of orientation between those two vectors. So what we see is that the area inside the magnetic field changes somehow. And that's what we saw in the previous problem. We can see that the amount of area in the magnetic field changes. The magnetic field did not change, and the orientation of this loop with respect to the magnetic field didn't change, and so the area changed. So that's one way that we can get an induced voltage or an induced current.
Another way is to have the magnetic field change. And then the last way is to have this angle change. And it can change just finitely or it can change continuously. What I'm going to do is walk through each one of these ways and each has a specific equation that goes with it because the different variable is changing. So let's look at area first. We have a changing area and I put many examples on here. Of course I have the one from our example but you can see up here I have a loop and it just changes area. It literally changes area. It goes from a full circle to some sort of ellipse. Here I have a rectangular loop moving into a magnetic field, so I'd say these two are about the same sort of thing except a different geometry of that loop. And then over here we can see that this bar, what's going on, this bar is sliding in the magnetic field and so that changes the area of this loop. If this bar slides in any way, and let's see it slides outward, we can see that the area in the magnetic field would be increasing, so that would be a changing area. So what we do is we take this delta term and we apply it to the area only, right? I have a change in flux and the B field isn't changing, that's a constant value. The theta isn't changing, that's a constant value. And so we have a changing area in the magnetic field and that will change with time. What I'm going to remind you is that area is a length times the width. So if I take a change in area with respect in time, then I'm going to have a change in a length times a width over time. I'm going to pull out of this term the one that remains constant in the problem. So when we look at this, if this is the length and this is the width, we can see that the width is changing in the magnetic field but not the length. Length stays constant and the width in the magnetic field is changing. So I'll pull the length out, L times delta W over delta T, and we're going to recognize this. We're in physics, right? This is a velocity. A change in a distance over time, that's a velocity. And so you can see that over in this problem, and you can see that over in this problem. There's velocities given in the problem. So you can see the equation here, negative N. LV comes from the area term, and then we still have the magnetic field. What we're going to assume is that that angle is zero. We'll just let phi equal zero. And that is the equation. And that's the one that you will use a lot. E equals, and I do a magnitude, N, L, V, B, assuming phi equals zero. So that's if the loop is moving in the magnetic field. You can see probably that there's a velocity here. It's moving in the magnetic field. If your area changes and there's not a velocity, which I would say is this situation up here, there's an A initial and an A final. Well, you can find an A initial and A final and then figure out what the time period is that it happened over and calculate delta A itself. And that is another way of figuring out the EMF. You're very likely to see this in any homework problems you work on. Another way that flux can change is to have a changing magnetic field. The next variable in here that can change is the magnetic field. Uh, we're going to hold the area constant. We're going to hold the angle constant and let the magnetic field change with time. You can see a graph over here. I pulled this from OpenStax University Physics Volume 2 where the magnetic field, this is the value of the magnetic field, and it changes over time. And what you would do is find the slope, right? There's a slope in here. And that's why I mentioned earlier, it's like the slope of a line. B final minus B initial, and then you can divide by a time period, and that would give you the change in magnetic field. There's a couple of other examples on here. We have the magnet just falling through a solenoid. This is an example of induced EMF because the magnetic field is changing. The area of the loops isn't changing, the number of loops isn't changing, the orientation of the loops with that magnet isn't changing, it's the magnetic field that's changing. And it'll change value similarly to this one through time and you can figure that out. So you can use this equation in order to calculate an EMF, you know, the number of loops, the area, the angle, and then figure out the change in the magnetic field over some time period.
I picked this example to work on, find the direction of induced current, so we can practice Lenz's law again. And I pulled this problem. Um, it's one I've used for years from Cutnell and Johnson, the ninth edition here. And what I'm going to note is that there's no B field given in this problem, but we know the B field due to a wire. The B field due to a wire is mu naught i over 2 pi r. And so this magnetic field changes through space. And the way I think about this is, and let me use right hand rule, uh, if I have current pointing to the right on the top, the magnetic field points out of the page. And it's a 1 over r dependence. So I put it this way, like when I'm farther away from the wire, I'll have a magnetic field. But as I get closer, that magnetic field will get larger, right? As it's closer, the 1 over r, I'll, as I get closer to the wire, that magnetic field gets larger. So up top, it's coming out at me. Underneath, it's into the page. So I'll put an into the page here. And then the size of these vectors represents the magnitude of the field. So you can see that it's larger closer to the wire and smaller away from the wire. So let's figure out direction of induced current. And I'm going to do one and then two. In region one, let's say that it moved from a position here to a position here. Okay, the loop moved and this will be an initial and a final. And so I'm going to do my flux analysis. I have an initial flux, a final flux, a change in flux, and that will tell me the direction of the induced magnetic field from which I can get the induced current, the direction of the induced current. So when I look at this initial situation here for one, uh, I have some magnetic field out of the page, some out. In the next situation, I have, I'm going to put more out. I haven't quantified it, I just know it's more. It has to be larger in that situation. So the change in flux was a gain out, right? So I get a gain out. And s what I know is the induced magnetic field will oppose that change. And so the induced magnetic field has to be into the page. If the magnetic field is into the page, my fingers into the page, the current will be clockwise in that situation. And so that would be the direction of the induced current. When I look in this situation, the induced current would be clockwise. Let's do underneath here. Um, I've seen a lot of students just knee jerk and say, well, it's underneath and it has to be the opposite then because the magnetic field's in the opposite direction. But let's verify. Uh, let me choose two different situations. Um, let's this be close to the wire, uh, be the initial situation, and then we're going to move farther away from the wire and that'll be the final situation. So when I'm close to the wire in the initial situation, I'm going to have some in. And then when I move to the final situation, I'm going to have less in. I've lost, right? So I have a loss in, loss in, which corresponds to a gain of out, right? The change in this magnetic field is out. If I take a really large vector in, in order to get a smaller vector in, I had to have some sort of change out of the page. So the change is out of the page, um, so I'll put it like that. The induced magnetic field has to oppose that gain out, so I'm going to get into the page. The induced magnetic field is into the page as well. And you can see by the same reasoning, I'm going to get a clockwise current in this situation as well. Okay, so that's another example of how to reason through Lenz's law with changing magnetic flux in this induced magnetic field. And this falls under induction because the magnetic field is changing in time. I didn't put anything in here about time. Uh, we assume that it's going to change in time. The last way that flux can change is to change the angle. All right, we already did the area, we already did the magnetic field. The only other variable that can change in this equation is the angle.
And so we're going to say the angle between the area vector and the magnetic field changes. You can see in the picture here, this is what I started out with. I just am rotating a loop in a magnetic field. And so the angle is changing. That relates to this omega value. Um, omega is a change in angle over a change in time. So let's look at the two ways that this angle can change. The coil rotates by a discrete angle. And so I kind of have a picture of that down here. Here we have the angle orientation here, and then we just rotate it by 90 degrees. And so when we do this, I would do an N, A, B, and then a change in the cosine theta. So I would do cosine theta final minus cosine theta initial. We have to take the change in the cosine term. You cannot just subtract the two angles and do cos theta final minus theta initial. That is not how to use the equation. You have to do cosine theta final minus cosine theta initial, and then you can multiply it by the number of loops, the area, in the magnetic field. So that's in the situation where there's a discrete angle. There could be a situation like I'm talking about up here where there's a continuous rotation. And when there's a continuous rotation, there's an omega. And then you take the differential of this, and what it turns out to be, E equals NAB, and we get an omega sine omega T, which is a really interesting way to do this. That's what happens when you take the derivative of a cosine is you get sine and an omega out front and the phi term because it becomes omega t, right? If I want a change in an angle, I take omega times a change in time and that would give me an angle. So that's why omega is in here. Uh, so that is the equation for a generator. If I have a constant, a continuous rotation with an angular speed. You may see this on your homeworks, uh, a discrete change in angle, and so you'd know how to deal with that. Often this electric generator makes it to homework assignments, so I picked out an example that exemplifies it. Calculate the peak voltage of a generator that rotates its 200 turn 10 centimeter diameter coil at 360 RPMs in a 0.8 Tesla field. And I borrowed this problem from OpenStax. So there's the equation over here. It says it wants a peak voltage. Uh, notice this is an EMF, so this is a voltage. And we want the peak voltage. And the peak voltage happens when this term on the end I get a sine 90 degrees, whatever that is, and that equals 1. So I don't have to worry about omega or t here. I'm just going to say I'm going to look at this coefficient in front of the sine term. Okay, So I'm going to take E equals NAB omega, and that will be the maximum or the peak voltage for that. Remember when we rotate a coil in a magnetic field, that voltage oscillates. And so they want us to find the peak voltage. At some other time, it will be less than that. And so when we set the sine equal to 90 degrees, remember this is 90 degrees, that's when we're going to get the peak voltage. So that's the equation here we're going to use. They give us N is 200. The area is um, a circle. There's a diameter given, so I'm assuming a circle. So I'm going to take pi times r squared, so I'm going to take 0.1 divided by 2 squared. They give me the diameter, and I have to divide that by that by 2 in order to get the radius. Uh, the magnetic field they give us is 0 0.8, and I need the omega on the end. This is not the omega. Omega has units radians per second, and so we're going to have to do some unit conversion here. That's how I think about this. I'm going to take 3600 revolutions in one minute, and I'm going to convert it to radians per second. I know that one revolution is 2 pi radians, and I know that one minute is 60 seconds, and so that should give me radians per second. Radians per second are out. So I can get rid of that. Um, 360 divided by 6 is 60, and overall I get omega is 120 pi radians per second. I'm not going to calculate that out. I'm just going to put this over in here. So 120 pi radians per second.
and I multiply all those through. When you run that through the calculator, the maximum voltage out of this generator is going to be 473.74 volts. And so that's as easy as that equation can be. There are more complicated situations, but I've left that for a separate lesson.